Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jill with Dr. Jill Live today. So excited to have a new guest today and a new friend. Uh, we haven't known each other that long, but I have great respect for what she's doing and so parallel to all of us in functional medicine with the gut. I hope you're real excited today because I know a ton of you struggle with gut issues. And today we're going to dive into some of the reasons why maybe if you've been diagnosed with IBS or SIBO that you haven't been able to overcome it. And I know Brie will enlighten us with some of her expertise and I'm excited about our conversation. Um, a little background, if you haven't seen our other episodes, we're all, we're out into the nineties now, and you can find them all on YouTube on my channel, which is just under my name. If you need any resources, I also have 10 plus years of weekly articles that are all available for free at jillcarnahan.com and products and services you can find at drjillhealth.com. So I want to introduce my guest today. Super excited to have Brie Weiselman here. Um, she's a licensed acupuncturist and medical director of Brie Weiselman Integrative Health. And it sounds like you have other practitioners, which I'd love to ask you about when we get into like how your clinic is run. Um, over the past 14 years, she and her team have empowered women with and men and women with transformation of health. And she has been an expert in hormone balance and fertility, which again, I'd love to maybe delve into that just a little uh, because it can have relation to the gut, right? <laughs> And she especially really. specializes with uh, healing digestive problems such as IBS, ulcerative colitis, parasitic infections, candida, and SIBO. Um, and I love what she talks about in her bio, getting a rebuilding a bulletproof microbiome. And that's where we're going to go today because again, a lot of the um, stuff on SIBO is great, but often, right, Brie, there's so many other things that can go wrong. And if you just look at SIBO, there's deeper reasons and we'll dive into all that today. Um, prior to starting your clinic or founding your clinic, she spent several years specializing in treatment of fertility and subfertility at se several IVF centers in, in San Francisco Bay area. And a uh, local clinic specializes in integrative treatment of hepatitis C. So that's awesome. Some of those cr chronic tough viral things. Um, she speaks and teaches all over. She's a guest on frequent podcasts. She's done much education similar to me. She did some work through the Kalish Institute in the Institute of Functional Medicine. And I am just absolutely delighted to have you here, Bree. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with you. So I always love to start on story as far as kind of how you got into functional integrative medicine, your journey. Um, tell us just a little bit about how that looks and like, even from, did you always want to go into some healing profession or how did that look for you, your journey? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think like many of us, I had my own health challenges mm -hmm. and then wound up finding myself seeking answers and putting together the pieces of the storyline. So I think I always knew I wanted to be uh, some kind of helping profession. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think I landed on medicine until a bit later. And the medicine piece actually happened, um, I mean, partially influenced by my backstory. I had severe asthma as a kid. Mm -hmm. I had some eating disorders as a teen. I um, That translated later into kind of like my version of veganism, which wasn't candidly very nutritionally complete. There's a lot of great ways to do that if you want to, but I wasn't doing it. And, um, you know, I really just didn't have the education. And so I recognized that when I wound up with, I, I um, diagnosed myself as having polycystic ovarian syndrome at the time that I was figuring that out. It wasn't widely known about unless you had a textbook case. Yeah. And so I figured out like, okay, why do I have all these irregular periods and, and acne that I didn't have as a teen, but now I have as a young adult, mm -hmm. and a bunch of things like that. And also this, you know, predisposition, frankly, when I was out of balance to run anxious or have panic attacks. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the things I dealt with, um, insomnia too, pretty bad insomnia that really drove me to seek answers because I was kind of falling apart by the time I was in my early twenties in med school, um, along with the best of us. And, um, I would say that the medicine piece kind of ironically happened because, um, in my teens, I w grew really enamored of, uh, plant-based psychedelics. I, I loved exploring with them and, you know, they're herbs, they're plants. And yeah. so I recognized that there was this magic synthesis between plants and humans. And yeah. so my first venture into, studying, you know, therapeutic medicine was studying um, uh, Western and European herbalism um, in Santa Cruz. And so I started learning about plants and, you know, how they're available to everyone. And then that segued into, you know, that just kept me going. Um, wow. Yeah. I love that. And I love, there's so many parallels. I was a vegetarian vegan from 14 until 25. And I always say it almost killed me. And it's oh not, gosh. it's not that I'm opposed to vegetarianism by any means. I have a lot of patients support them and I'm actually primary plant-based still. So, mm -hmm. but, but the difference was like you, I, I was not healthy in the way I looked at, you know, and I had, it was carbitarian basically. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, 
and processed soy substitutes. Processed soyitarian. Yeah, right, right. So I like, now I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, and I had cancer at 25 and I look at that diet and I think part of that was leading and I didn't know I had celiac, so I was eating a lot of gluten. So again, we can, we don't need to talk about my story because people have heard it, but it's so parallel and that our choices really do affect our mood and our weight and our, uh, and even like feeling bloated or overweight. I wasn't really ever overweight, but I didn't feel well in my own body because I was eating the wrong foods, right? And my gut was horribly dysbiotic. So it's interesting to have those experiences as our, you know, ourselves and, um, and really understand it on a different level. And it sounds like you had that journey too. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, what you just said could have been, yeah. could have come out of my mouth, yeah, and, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then like what you're saying is your main, if the main big, big thing for you was immune dysfunction. Right. And so for me, it was hormones. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is that ultimately what we all come to is it ties back to gut health. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's dive in because SIBO is kind of our topic, but I think what you and I both want to do is say, well, what else is, is potentially going on with SIBO? And then how do we really get, because you mentioned even in our emails back and forth, and I know patients can uh, attest to this, that often you're diagnosed and then six months later, you're diagnosed again, it's recurrent and people go in the cycle and they're like, do I, can I ever get rid of SIBO? So first of all, let's talk a little bit about what is SIBO and what is the connection to IBS? Because often this label of IBS is really kind of a wastebasket term. It describes the symptoms, but it doesn't tell the why as far as why you're having the symptoms. So do you want to start Absolutely. with that? Right. So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and we shorten that to SIBO. Mm -hmm. And many people have heard a lot about this, but essentially it's just the idea that we should have a large amount of bacteria in our colon or large intestine, but our small intestine should be not sterile, but relatively so. Yeah. And so um, if everything's working appropriately, we have the right motility, we have the right digestive power and secretions um, and so on and so forth, then what happens is we kind of maintain that situation, but there's a whole bunch of things that can break or go off that wind up allowing colonization of bacteria where they shouldn't be, you know, bacteria gone wild in the yes. small intestine. Yeah. And so that's basically SIBO. And what that leads to is a lot of the symptoms now known as IBS. And we know that most cases of IBS have at least a SIBO component um, from the research. And that, you know, basically if you have bacteria living where they shouldn't be, um, they are going to ferment anything they can get their hands on that you didn't manage to digest completely. Um, and then that will create gas and bloating and a lot of times pain from the distension, inflammation, leaky gut, and so on and so forth. And all of the symptoms that can go along with IBS, constipation, diarrhea, mm -hmm. and so on. So the yeah. tricky thing is, is that, oh, go ahead. No, that's okay. Keep going. Well, the tricky thing is just that, um, you know, now we know that basically SIBO equals IBS, but the thing is that there's all these other digestive pathogens or dysbiotic arrangements that can basically yield the same symptoms. And so when I was in Chinese medicine school, there was like a proverb and I'm probably butchering it because I don't, you know, speak Mandarin, but basically it was something like you're entitled to have more than one problem at the same time. Oh, and that is so, I just want to pause there because Western medicine is the opposite. It's like everything should be this unifying one size fits all diagnosis. And a lot of times that causes um, docs to really not look outside that. Well, it can't be anything else because it's this, or if they, if they don't have an answer or a ICD nine or 10 code for that, they say, well, it's all in your head, right? These things that they're not true. And I get so frustrated and patients get so discouraged because I love that you share that. <laughs> oh yeah. And I mean, no discredit at all to any of our medical professionals, but it's so true. And it's really a symptom. I see us as victim to the system, right? Yeah. Like if that's how we're conditioned yeah. to think, even as patients, that's how we're conditioned to think from the time we're kids, you know, we're going to look for the one answer. And so even people who are well-versed in functional medicine, mm -hmm. I'm sure you hear this all the time, but you come in, you're working with someone and they're like, okay, so is when you finally find a new piece of information, yeah. is this the thing that's going to yes. be better? And of course, like my heart breaks. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, of course you want to just say yes. It's that simple. But like those of us who got into the, the functional medicine field and surrounding fields are medical truth seekers because yes. we tend to not be afraid of the the mystery and the unknown and admitting that for every one thing we learn, there's like 10 things we have questions about. And we understand that there's going to be multiple overlying causes, you know? Oh, this is so good. Cause if you're out there suffering and wondering like, why am I going to get better? We're going to go into that. So hang tight. But the other thing that's so important here is 
Um, there is no one size fits all. And often it's very, very complex and there's layers. And I'm like you, I'm sitting in front of the patient listening, like, oh, okay, we'll have to do this in my mind. We'll have to do this first and then this and then this. And then the topic we're not going to talk a lot about today because we could spend a whole other hour, but mold and Lyme disease and some of these really complex, which is now the, you know, a huge portion of my practice. Mm -hmm. There is so many layers. And I always say, you know, six to 18 months is minimum for start. So if this is a, this is a long haul. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that you're doing that. I love that you're talking about the complexity. Well, speaking of complexity, SIBO. Okay. So granted, uh, we've kind of described this bacterial overgrowth. You did a fantastic job of kind of describing what it is. And I think according to some of the experts research is about 80% of IBS at the mm -hmm. high end is actually SIBO, mm -hmm. but what else can mimic SIBO or go alongside? Do you want to go into some of the other things that you see as far as treatment and that we need to think about that could also be there, um, that could contribute to the either, you know, consistent recurrence of symptoms? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is basically how you were just saying, I stack my, my list of like, okay, we have to do this and then this, and then this, in this sequential order, there's also an order to the diagnostics. So it's really mm -hmm. common that, you know, someone comes to see me and they've, I'm not their first time at the rodeo, right? They've seen mm -hmm. a two, three, five really great practitioners, but they've maybe even done treatments for SIBO. They know they have SIBO. They can tell me all about it. But um, a lot of times the like first stop is they never tested stool panels, like mm -hmm. just basic. And sometimes they have, but maybe they haven't, they only run one or they haven't run one that really was optimized to look for pathogens mm -hmm. versus uh, general bacteria diaspora. So I always have people run two stool panels side by side. That's just kind of a hallmark of how I practice after years of seeing even the best panels, mm -hmm. like the state of the art panels in the field miss something and another one catches it. Um, and there can be a lot of discussion about that, like overdiagnosis and stuff. But basically, if we have, um, for example, you can have, there's tons of parasites that mimic or trigger in, uh, inflammatory bowel disorder or IBS. So um, Giardia lamlia, Entamoeba histolytica, Cyclospora, Cryptosporidium, even Blastocystis mm -hmm. uh, hominis, which is a, a protozoa that can be commensal, like in some people. And again, this is one of those, I think about my Chinese medicine training, it's yeah. the, there's the pathogen and there's the terrain, right? So it's like, how well do we tolerate the things that we have is as important as the name of the bad guy. Yeah. So blasto, that's why it's confusing. You can have blasto show up and not be sick from it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also have, you know, but blastocystis is found in 67% of patients with IBS and can in and of itself create symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so other organisms I look for, Cryptosporidium, um, Defragilis, mm -hmm. uh, Diantamibifragilis. So a lot of those, so definitely your, your protozoa and pathogenic parasites are biggies. And if somebody shows up as having those on stool testing, I absolutely will clear them. Um, and there's an order to operations of how I approach these things. So I tend to work from the top down and also from the relatively macro to the relatively micro, meaning, um, so if I find something that tends to reside predominantly in the upper GI, like H. pylori, uh -huh. um, uh, H. pylori is a bacteria that, again, can, falls into that category of could be commensal, could be problematic, depending on the criteria um, and in who and when. And so if we have a huge overcolonization of H. pylori in the um, usually it's found in the stomach and the mm -hmm. proximal part of the small intestine, um, that will really uh, radically impede our ability to have optimal hydrochloric acid levels. And so because, and I want to talk about that later, yeah. that is such a, a key criteria for reestablishing gut health and for um, having, you know, anti-pathogenic activity, basically our defense mechanisms. I'll treat that first and then go into the larger protozoan parasites and then clear things that fall into the realm of dysbiotic bacteria like SIBO um, or just dysbiosis. Um, and usually things like fungal overgrowth, which I didn't mention, but I'm about to, um, fungal dysbiosis, I'll kind of usually handle that last, although there are a couple caveats. For example, if someone has SIBO of the methane dominant type, mm -hmm. around five years ago, I started switching it up and treating the fungi first. Um, if there was also a, a CIFO or fungal mm -hmm. candida dysbiosis. And I found that that worked better clinically. Yeah. Um, later on down the line, I heard ideas around why that was having to do with fungi being able to create a low oxygen environment and uh, the methanogens thrive there. And so I don't know if that's true or not. I just know that this is that typically when I yeah. treat them in that order, it works better. So um, those are some of them. I would say, you know, fungal, um, the fungal microbiome, 
again, is a huge consideration mm-hmm. because, you know, gosh, testing for, for fungi and candida is like, it's kind of the wild west. It's, it's tough. And the reason yeah. is that, you know, they're hard to, to find. They yes. are smart. Yes. <laughs> um, they'll, the gold standard obviously is, you know, aspirate, um, which is invasive, you know, going in, getting a sample of the fluid mm-hmm. and looking if they're there, but that's not practical in clinic. So we don't, none of us do that outside of studies. Um, stool testing, obviously you mm-hmm. can look for markers of candida and other um, dysbiotic fungi there, but it can be hard to catch. And that's sometimes by virtue of location, right? So mm-hmm. when you, what you're seeing on a stool panel is often mostly reflective of what's in the colon. But the thing about uh, uh, candida in particular is that it can really colonize anywhere along the GI tract. Yeah. You're not always seeing the same rate of shed. It also, you know, is sneaky and transitions between yeah. fungi and yeast form. So just like other myco molds, it can go intracellular um, and can hide, you know, or not shed, uh, not shed and then shed. And um, so there's various ways that you can detect that uh, organic acids, yeah. um, antibodies to the to candida um, and stool testing being some of the main ones. But what I find is that a lot of times the most common symptoms of uh, fungal overgrowth, especially small intestine um, kind are exactly the same as SIBO, right? Mm-hmm. Belching, bloating, indigestion, nausea, diarrhea, gas, constipation. And um, there were actually studies in 2015 done that 25% of patients with unexplained GI symptoms did have CFO or small yeah. intestinal fungal overgrowth. And, you know, then I'll see that a, a clue for me is if it worsened after someone was treated with yeah. like, rifaxim and neomycin, mm-hmm. right? Um, kind of fuel on the fungal fire. So those are some of the biggies. And I think, you know, just the overarching take home is um, not to settle on one pathogen or yeah. one problem there and to make sure that we're complete in our investigation. Like what else might be contributing? And a lot of those organisms like to party together. I yes. you know, basically like you'll see, you know, um, the three best friends that anyone could have um, are like, you know, Giardia, Blasto or Giardia, Blasto and Candida and I'll throw H. pylori in there, but those yeah. guys really uh, are mutually supportive and commensal. You'll often see C. diff and Candida yeah. as co-infections. So there's, you can go on and on. There's all kinds of partnerships there. But when I see one, I'll often suspect and look a little bit deeper to make mm-hmm. sure that we're uh, getting all those, especially when someone doesn't respond to treatment, meaning yeah. they keep getting ongoing infections. Mm. Love that overview. So many pearls of wisdom there. First of all, the fact that you do two stool tests. I often do, but sometimes I'll do one and then a few minutes later do another, but I love the idea of actually doing them. And most people probably that see you and definitely that see me as well are, have been other places and are kind of like, we've won an answer. So I love that pearl. Um, and because we have no sponsorship or association, can I ask what tests do you like to use? Yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I will say it's changed over the years, right? Yeah, me too. Since like 2000 something, you know, or early aughts. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. So right now what I do is I run the GI map and then mm-hmm. there's a panel called para wellness. Yes. That's actually old school technology. Yes. You know, it's like, and he triple stains it. They're yeah. very thorough and it's awesome. So between those two, yeah. And, and what I'd say is those are the panels I run when I'm looking for pathogens. Mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of yeah. awesome panels when you're looking yeah. to optimize microbiome, like biome effects and yes. some others that are similar. Yes. Love those. Um, yeah. Okay. I love that. Very parallel, completely. Right? Is and, that what and, you do? Yeah. And I love that you mentioned exactly what I was thinking with um, candida, organic acids, serum antibodies, stool, and even then sometimes you'll miss it. So, um, and I will tell you like the old uh, GI effects, which I still occasionally mm-hmm. use, or some of those that give, it's not PCR for the candida. It'll just give a level. If yeah. it's one plus, if it's there at all, it's there. <laughs> so yeah. just because it's one, you know, so I love this because I think we think and practice. Really Absolutely. Similar. And one last one to throw <laughs> yeah, in there because yeah. I don't often run it anymore, but the doctor's data, they yeah. actually culture it out, which, yeah. not, you know, oxygen rich environment, all yeah. that, but once in a while, you'll find it there when you can't. You know, yeah. so, yeah. and what you were, you and I know this, but what works for those of you listening, each, each uh, stool test has different technologies. So us as practitioners really have to know, are we looking for PCR DNA? Are we looking for culture? Because some of those one might detect it and the other might not. Mm-hmm. And that's, what's tricky. And I love that you mentioned para wellness because the parasites, no matter what test you use are the most difficult to detect. So if you've been suffering from gut issues forever and you either haven't had a good stool test or whatever, that would be the thing that's probably missing because it's very hard to detect. Would you agree? I would absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I've even gone to sometimes where I'm highly suspicious. I have a history or whatever, and I'll just prophylactically treat. I have a couple of protocols I've that I'll that. just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, 
So good. A couple of the questions. Um, H. pylori, like blasto, I think both of those can be commensals. Mm -hmm. So um, what would be a decision-making thing that you would do for blasto or H. pylori on whether or not to treat? Like, would you most of the time treat if they have symptoms or is there any kind of criteria no. you decide which ones to treat and which not to treat? Yeah, great question. Um, so blasto, I mean, it's kind of simple point and shoot. It's mm -hmm. like if you're by the time someone's coming to me, there usually is a Somatic, yeah. problem. Um, so then I usually would treat it, I'm gonna say. You know, if someone's coming to me, me let's too. say for something that's strictly in the realm of women's health and hormones, and yeah. they happen to have blasto and they really have no GI complaints and there's other stuff going on, I might not, you know, Got it. yeah. Why disrupt the microbiome even in a relatively mm -hmm. safe way. Um, now with H. pylori, I have kind of like this, yeah, hierarchy of how I think about it. So mm -hmm. one, is it overgrown, like mm -hmm. actually overgrown? Yeah. Um, and then two, um, are there virulence factors? Mm -hmm. so if there's a virulence factor, I'm at least going to treat to try and clear the virulence factor at the bare minimum. And then three, are, is the person symptomatic, mm -hmm. right? So those are kind of the, the three criteria. Um, if someone has over overgrowth plus a virulence factor, even if they're not super symptomatic, I might yeah. recommend let's use some like probiotics that inhibit yeah. it or some, th some things that uh, disrupt in adherence like uh, sulforaphane yeah. or NAC or something just to kind of, you know, dial it back. But if someone's symptomatic and has either of those factors, then for sure, we're going to try and change it. Okay. Love that. And one of the things I think methane SIBO is the other thing I had questions about, because I know our listeners who've had SIBO, that might be the one that goes back. And like, oh. I find that to be the most common recurrence. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard, right? It's a hard um, one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just when you're listening, basically there's hydrogen SIBO, there's methane SIBO and there's hydrogen sulfide mm -hmm. SIBO, which we, we can now test. Um, what do you typically do? Do you do the breath tests as well for those? And do you have any particular favorites for breath? I tests? do. I'm a real stickler about the breath tests. Like, I mean, I get that there's a lot of ways we can find suggestions for yeah. sure. You can look at stool panels and other markers and find suggestions of it. You can suspect it based on history and symptoms. I do like the breath test. Um, again, I've danced around over the years. Yeah. Um, with the different testing. I currently am using primarily the Trio Smart, which is the, it has the three gases. Yep. I love that we can finally test yes. hydrogen sulfide. Oh, what a relief, right? Two. I know. <laughs> I know. Finally. But I'm adding, I'm redoing something that I um, used to do is um, for a long time I was using, um, before BioHealth Labs closed, they offered a test that had used three substrates for testing. Uh, yeah. So I'm going back to adding in the fructose based on um, yeah. data that's showing that that's mm -hmm just how much higher, I think actually there was just a recent talk with Jason Harlock about this. That um, Yeah, there's just the same thing, like, very recent right? article about how big of deal the fructose is, yes. Yeah, and you just did this genius quantification of the data to actually, and I was like, oh, so I thought it was like that, yeah. but now we know it's like that, so thanks Jason. But um, yeah, I mean, so we're going back to instituting fructose testing parallel to the lactulose at every uh, every time we bother to test first. Perfect. Season. Do you yeah. do that with that same kit or a different, um, can you do that with a I don't, uh, we're doing yeah, it right, right now with a different kit, but I'm actually kind of trying to figure out what the best yeah. way of doing it is. So yeah, yeah. If you keep me posted because I'm the same exact thing. I'm like, how do we do this? So, so. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Oh, I love that though. So far. So, um, so we talked about age. So let's talk just a little bit about, we've talked about diagnosis. People mm -hmm. have a pretty good idea of the other things. I want to, in just a minute, go to what you mentioned, the eight, the uh, hydrochloric acid and some of the upstream mm -hmm. and downstream things. But before we do, um, Let's talk just briefly about, say, blasto. Um, there's herbal and there's medication treatments. What are some mm -hmm. of the common things you would use for the protozoa? And then uh -huh. let's talk about H. pylori and then let's talk about SIBO, briefly treatments. Kind oh, of. yeah, great. Okay. So, um, yeah, blasto, you know what? I, I have not had much of a hard time clearing that herbally. Um, awesome. It's usually like one of two directions. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a cocktail of your, you know, there's a whole bunch of different anti-parasitic yeah. formulas from various mm -hmm. companies. Yeah. One I lean on heavily is GI Microbex from Designs mm -hmm. for Health, but there's a bunch, you know, old school tricyclin yeah. by ortho, you know, there's all the different ones. So sometimes it's a matter of like which particular cocktail in what ratios of herbs, mm -hmm. but I'll use a product like that. And one of the key things that I see is that I think that a lot of times practitioners are a little bit shy based on the dosages that are on a bottle. Yes. So when you're when someone's being observed by you, which they are, you yeah. know, for health, I'll, I'll dial up those dosages, sometimes pretty high. So I'll start, you know, baseline using, you know, two caps three times a day if mm -hmm. of a product, but I'll go up from there mm -hmm. sometimes. And I'll usually use multiple things. So um, I have reinstituted using more oregano oils. I had kind of uh, laid off for a while, but then um, recently I've read research that shows that there's actually prebiotic 
mm. um, components of oregano that do promote some of the beneficials. So um, judiciously, I'm using yeah. it. And then someone who has, you know, a completely wiped out beneficial microbiome, I might be a little bit more cautious. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of the products in the line, um, you know, biocidin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'll also add, include, even if there's artemisia in a formula, one of the key things I do when there's either a resistant parasite or just something like blasto, which is known to kind of be a little tougher, is I'll use um, artemisia. And I think of that um, kind of like how I would, and again, I can't prescribe diflucan, but like what I mean is you monitor it. So I'll, yes. like, if I have any suspicion, there's going to be an issue. Uh, Artemisia is an herb that can be uh, toxic to the liver if taken too long or in too high of doses. So I'll run liver enzymes before yeah. or after starting it, just, or if anyone has any symptoms that could be um, related to, to strain yeah. on the liver pain or anything, I will um, have them stop it right away and retest to make sure they're okay. So. Oh, love it again. So parallel. And I love that you talked about those because you really, that's exactly the thing I found two tricks that you may not know from your doctor or you may have had is number one, the dose matters. And I'm like you, I actually push it pretty hard, but that's what gets results. And number two is sometimes uh, say someone has persistent candida or SIBO or these, and even in my history, 20 years with Crohn's disease, one reason my gut's in great shape is I have stayed on some low level herbs to keep that suppressed <laughs> for years, yep. for years. So some of you are like, oh, can I be done in eight weeks? Well, yeah, but it'll probably come back. <laughs> so uh -huh. so uh -huh. that, that I think for some people, now not everybody, I have a weaker immune system. I have a history of Crohn's. So for me, it's definitely, I need that suppressive dose, but olive leaf, caprylic acid, there's a few things oh, I'm yeah. still on long-term. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. And especially, um, that's one of the reasons I particularly love biocidin mm -hmm. um, because, well, also I just love Chinese. Yeah. That's my yes. training. And I know, you know, the, the formula, I know the company, um, yeah. but basically- um, so many of those herbs are prebiotic and they oh, know wow. the flora. So you can be having this antimicrobial activity going yeah. on, not to the exclusion of yes. growing out the good yes. guys. Right. And so, I mean, I agree. I'll sometimes keep someone on one product or something small, low key yeah. while we move on to next pieces. Absolutely. Okay. Love that. Let's switch to H pylori. That's another tricky <laughs> one. What are some tricks as herbs and things that are powerful against H pylori? Okay. Yeah. So I'll use a lot of mastica and again, I'll dose that up pretty high. Yeah. Um, some of the zinc carnosines mm -hmm. or the more recent iterations of zinc and pep zincs and stuff that mm -hmm. are have affinity to zinc matters like the delivery yeah. form, right? Yes. What you're trying yes. to achieve with zinc is different. If you're trying to raise someone's intracellular level versus fight off yeah. a cold versus right. Yeah. So yeah. I'll use one that targets the mucosal uh, membranes. And then, um, I like a lot of the newer formulations of the, um, licorice, you know, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, DGL and such, yeah. but there's newer ones that like gut guard that really, uh -huh. um, really are shown in studies to block adherence of H. pylori yeah. to the membrane. So a lot of H. pylori is about killing, you know, disrupting its ability to adhere, mm -hmm. um, and lowering its numbers. So of course things, there's also things like, um, I'll use L plantarum, which yeah. is shown to inhibit it. I'll use, uh, sulforaphane in different forms, NAC, uh -huh. those all, um, block ability to adhere. But also that's, you know, in particular with H. pylori, like if we don't have the right acidity in the gut, it's not going to clear. Yeah. So, so many times people say I've had H. pylori three, four times. And then I'm looking at like the dysbiotics, you know, the ones yeah. from the mouth yeah. that show up on the stool panel. Uh -huh. oh, you've got huge levels of staph and strep and like enteric. Okay. Well, that's because yeah. you don't have enough stomach acid to kill, you know, to clear this basically. So mm -hmm. then we'll really focus in on things like bitters and using BT and HCL and, um, and then looking at beyond that, like, so, okay. So it's a little chicken in the egg, right? Because yeah. Um, certain bacteria like H. pylori basically deconjugate or break down our stomach acid mm -hmm. as a way of ensuring their survival. Mm -hmm. So they're brilliant like that. But then also we need to restore the acid to and clear the bacteria to yeah. optimize the HCL. So both, both are true. So I'll often do some replacement, but then I want to make sure that it's actually coming back on its own if possible, you know, barring some other cause. Mm, love that. And that's kind of where we were going with these root causes. That's one of those things that causes recurrent SIBO, these upstream things. What are some other upstream oh, issues? Gosh. Right. Well, that, literal upstream, yeah, literal upstream. Yeah. So, so I love that you said that. So this is kind of like, it's funny. It's one of those things that was like, probably the first things, you know, when you started learning gut health, it was like four hours and right. Yeah. All that. Okay. So, um, the simplest things are often the most powerful and the most time tested. So basically I think upstream. So literally I start with the mouth. So 
what's going on in the dental microbiome. And if yes. we're not like, basically if anyone's practicing gut medicine and not thinking about that, like, please start paying attention. You know, most people are aware of that at this point in time, but there's so many of those gram negative bacteria that colonize the mouth and also huge levels of fungi. So I've read studies where one of my favorite ones is there was, they were testing stool panels for candida and just by having people brush their teeth three times a day, we're able to significantly lower wow. the level of candida in the stool test without any diet change or any treatment. Um, so really all these things colonize our, our um, oral microbiome, our sinus. And then what happens is they, you know, are swallowed with our food. So we have to take care of the mouth. And so if we have any, you know, if we have any, 94% of Americans have some form of gingivitis. So yeah. basically if I have anyone with GI issues, we're going to treat the mouth. But if you have any kind of dental issues, I'll use again, uh, the like dental side or bio side yeah. or some kind of silver preparation and just, you know, treat the mouth at least while we're treating the gut. And then also, um, you know, chewing. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so how we eat and really this kind of is a bigger topic than just chewing. It's about so chewing, you know, it does help actually allow time for signaling, signaling to happen to prime the gut and it allows all the saliva to do the first stage of digestion, make the, our carbohydrates and certain parts of the proteins more available to be digested. But the signaling allows for HCL and pancreatic digestive enzyme secretion. But the other thing that happens is in order to chew our food that much, we kind of have to be, we have to slow down. Yes. We can't be in a rush. And so this is a really hard one in this day and age because everybody's, you know, technology hasn't made our lives any simpler. Yeah. Everybody's so busy. And so what I see as like such a huge driver, and I do want to get back to the actual digestive secretions, but mm -hmm. what I see as such a huge driver of all chronic GI issues is really that sympathetic dominance, yes. um, not enough balance between the gas and the brakes of our nervous system. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't allow for vagus nerve signaling, which is everything for digestion. We yeah. get, you know, if we don't have that proper signaling, our motility shuts down and everything sits there and ferments. Yeah. Um, and that beautiful coral bloom of bacteria after we get done with a meal happens, you know, where it shouldn't, <laughs> not yes. down in the colon, but in the small intestine. Um, we don't make, you know, when our body thinks we're in an emergency state or in go mode, it says, Hey, you can eat later. You know, yeah, obviously yeah, there's yeah. something going on where it's not a good time. You'll be vulnerable if you sit yes. and digest your food. So we don't make those, all those secretions. And so I think a lot about things like addressing traumas, mm -hmm. um, if they haven't been and not yeah. me, but helping yeah. someone resource to, to find a good match for getting support with that. I think about all the neuroplasticity, gut yeah. brain access stuff, you know, I love Gupta program. I love mm -hmm. feedback. I like frequency specific microcurrent or at least vagal nerve stem, yeah. which you can do at home with a, you know, little e uh -huh. device, acupuncture, Qigong, EMDR, somatics, like, you know, there's a million ways in. Yeah. So just getting us to drop into that um, parasympathetic state is everything and at the very least just like stopping and taking a breath before the meal mm -hmm. it sounds so simple but it's so profound and eating outside if possible yeah. when weather permits and like wherever you live like actually taking your meal outside and breathing fresh air and mm -hmm. feeling hopefully the sun on your face I'm yeah so we were just talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh. but that, that stuff's huge I can't I can't really you know uh or emphasize it I love that you went there because it's so critical, especially now people are more stressed than ever. There's just so much going on and the isolation and the pandemic and everything. Um, and so it is really critical because this is one of those missing pieces. I remember years ago, I'm in Boulder and uh, starting to treat some athletes and they, especially if they're training or whatever, I, I couldn't heal their gut, right? Because they're doing triathlons and they're training and they get this divergence of this splanchnic flow, blood flow that should go to the gut for healing. It's all in their periphery doing their, you know, training. Uh -huh. so Right. So, so I always would be like, okay, well decide when you want to be either in between seasons or we can't really focus on this. If you're training, I just, I, it won't work. Right. So totally. same, same idea. Cause they're using all the blood flow to the periphery. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you are intensively training and you want to heal your gut, you might want to take a break or decide mm -hmm. timing wise, but that's a, because you're again, in your sympathetic um, system and, and not really able to rest and relax and restore. But I love that you mentioned that. Um, oh my gosh, we covered so much. Let me think about what else is, um, talked about treatment protocols. We talked about methane. We didn't talk a lot about methane. I feel like that's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. 
there's the classical <laughs> medication routes that always require a couple medications, but what about herbs? Because I feel like herbs can be a little tricky. I find a few, I have a few things that I like, but what do you like to use for methane SIBO? Uh, I mean, my basis is always garlic, right? The yeah. allicin, um, yes. that's always like a given. And then yeah. I rotate in the other things. So I'll use a lot of the um, like ADP oregano mm -hmm. that is kind of yeah. uh, um, just for everyone out there. It's like a, a form that releases a little bit more slowly mm -hmm. without having like a time release coating yeah. basically um, and can give a little more access. So I'll use that. Um, I'll definitely use a lot of probiotics, I'll use, but specific ones. Yeah. Um, I'll use... Um, I'll tend to incorporate some biofilm disruptors with that mm -hmm. one. Like sometimes something like biofilm phase two that has, you know, a little bit more potent of an activity because of the bismuth, yeah. at least some of the enzymes, uh, yeah. enzyme-based biofilm disruptors. Um, I'll also, so oregano sometimes, um, sometimes more berberine, but definitely the garlic is like mm -hmm. the backbone, but I agree with you. It's more challenging. And sometimes it takes a little bit more, I don't want to say guess and check, but yeah. kind of you do a little bit of one, you take yeah. your, based on the other information at hand, you see what it does. And if not, you switch directions. I definitely do some of that mm. with mm. it. Um, and um, I think that a lot of the times the inclusion of something antifungal, even without a strict fungal diagnosis and without it being a full-fledged antifungal program has been helpful. That's another thing uh, that I'll do. So whether that's just like some um, propolis or some, you know, yeah caprylic acid type yeah. thing or some loracidin or those have sometimes I've seen been big boosters. And then also, oh, so what I didn't really completely talk about was um, optimizing digestive secretions. Yes, yes. Um, what I just wanted to mention, because I mean, there's a lot of information about this out there, but I rarely, if ever treat anyone uh, without at least the inclusion of something to promote acid, either bitters or yes. HCL, but also I use, I heavily lean on pancreatic uh, digestive enzyme yes. support, like yes. a lot of pancreatin. And the key there is that, and, and why? Okay, so those digest carbs and, sh and break down, you know, sugars, fats and starches to some extent. Um, we can see if someone's actually low based on their elastase level yes. on a stool panel, but I have a different marker for mm -hmm. what I call low than what the lab will yes. call low. So I want them to be pretty decently high. And that will help prevent unbroken down food from being fermented. But the key is that we need enough, we need the right pH for them to work. Yeah. So like if you just give enzymes in someone who doesn't have the right acidity, they're probably not going to do much. So mm -hmm. those are always kind of a combo thing. And I play with the different levels yeah. um, separately. Um, and then each of those, what happens is that in turn, um, we need that pH change to happen in order for bile to be released. And so bile is like this huge piece. So that was what yeah. I really wanted to say is uh, that for methane, what I found is that bile, 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 there's almost always a bile problem. So bile release, the, what happens is basically that <clears throat> we need, so we need enough acid to stimulate bile release. And then we need enough of the, we need hydration to make enough bile. Yeah. And so many people with GI issues are dehydrated because yeah. it doesn't feel good to drink a lot of water or to have frequent water. So, you know, there we go, you know, there's not enough water. Um, and then they're also deficient in fat soluble nutrients because they haven't been yes. able to absorb and digest their fats. Now what happens is, so one of bile's job is obviously digesting fat, but the other job, <clears throat> is that it absorbs toxins to be presented yes. to the liver and where it's doing that primarily is in the gut. Um, so we have, you know, if you have a whole bunch of gram negative bacteria, so you have LPS entering, mm -hmm. maybe you also have candida spilling a bunch of, you know, ethanol and, and its metabolites, um, parasites with their toxins, the bile gets saturated, carries that to the liver. And then if it's doing that over and over and over again, time, you know, day in and day mm -hmm. out with all these other stressors on the system, eventually we kind of get, can easily get depleted and yeah. recycled bile acids we should have. So I see that as problematic for um, the rhythm and timing of motility. There's a role that bile has to play with that. And also, of course, with being uh, bactericidal, like bile yeah. is microbial and antifungal. So that's another thing that I see is for methane really emphasizing um, any clues that someone might have not enough bile. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have done such a great job in our last like 40 minutes or so. We, we've been everywhere. I mean, we really covered a lot and you are so knowledgeable. I love I, what really was. It was amazing. I think people are going to really, 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 and they're going to want to rewind and listen to this again and all those little tips and tricks. I will say, because we mentioned special herbs and very specific things, please consult your medical professional to help you with this. 
Um, granted, I mean, you can try things, but we're not giving medical advice and this can be complicated. And there's lots of good practitioners like Brie out there that can help you. Um, speaking of which, Brie, if you want to know more about you, where can they find you? Tell us more about your space and where they can find you. Absolutely. Well, so there's always my website, which is BrieWeiselman.com. My last name's a little tricky to, to spell, but don't worry if you try for it on Google, you'll get there. Um, we'll also put the link below. And I hang out a lot on Instagram, actually. Awesome. Um, so if you want to just, you know, chat with me there through my profile, I'm available and underneath my posts. Um, and then um, I'm available for consultation. I also have a team of three practitioners and a health coach working with me and an amazing back office team to make it all work. Awesome. <laughs> we can't not see them. Yeah. And you're in Portland, did you say, right? Do you do virtual consults too? I am. I'm in Portland. I actually, at this point, only do virtual consults. So okay. I moved up here four and a half months ago. I've been in Santa Cruz for 25 years or 23 years prior. And um, for the last about like five to seven years, I've primarily been virtual. So we work with people all over the U.S. and have worked a lot uh, internationally as well. Awesome. Yeah. So I will be sure in everywhere you can hear this, the podcast, wherever you find it, I will uh, link up to Brie. And Brie, it has been a pleasure. We're going to have to do part two. This was so full of good information. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh my gosh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.